uh, firstly, man, for organizing such a great event. I understand that it's a full house, so I hope <clears throat> you will enjoy it um, and that I provide a different perspective on, on materials and design and why it's important for designers to think about materials in a completely different way to how they've thought about it before. So I started with this question, what do you want your material to be? And the question is because as designers, as industrial designers as I am, we don't start with the material, we start with the shape and then we think about the, the details and then we think about the material. The material is at the end, but actually as the world is changing and as design is evolving, um, you can see more examples of how materials are at the beginning of the process. And when I first started writing about materials, um, and I had to think about how I wanted to tell a different story. I really tried to think about the materials that I was writing about as characters um, to communicate the stories of these characters and to help readers to understand what they can do and their value and how to use them in better ways. So the story that I'm going to tell you today is in five chapters and it will cover many, many different kind of thoughts that I have about materials. But it comes back to this fundamental question that is, rather than thinking about materials at the end, what happens if you put materials at the beginning and actually think about your material and what it can do and how you can use it. So before we go into any kind of detail, you have to understand that a material is connected with the process. You can't separate the two. And actually when people ask me, what my favorite material is, it's not really a question that I can answer because a material without a, a use, without a context has no value. And it's only when you start to apply it and you start to shape it that actually then becomes something important. So if we take a, a simple bowl, a simple container like this, uh, and then we look at different materials because of the material, because of how you process the material, because of the properties of the material, because of the structure of the material, it will give you many different outcomes. So you can have paper or you can have glass or you can have straw, or you can have metal, you can have plastic. And depending on each of these materials and the way that you process it, you can have so many different combinations. So you can't separate material from process. If we just take one material as an example, we take paper, there is no kind of limit to what you can do with a piece of paper within this simple context. So using the material and the process together is the first part of this question to ask your materials what they want to be. And then if we just think about the materials and we just think about what's out there in terms of materials, there are more and more materials that you can find that you can use in your design process. And you have at Hong Kong Poly U this fantastic materials resource. And it's very important that you don't use this resource as just the way to find your answers to, to find the answers to the questions but actually to think about it as a creative tool so go in there and ask these materials that you see around you what is it you want to be materials or if you really want you can develop your own materials like this uh, series of bowls by a designer called lucy de Bote, who decided to look at different parts of london and to look at the dessert uh, dust that was coming from different parts of london and how they can be combined to create different effects within ceramics based on what type of dirt you get in which part of the city. And you can see more and more examples of not necessarily designers taking a material and asking it what it wants to be, but actually designers developing their own materials, developing their own characters, their own stories. If you look at um, how we are becoming more um, accustomed to thinking about materials and actually being surrounded by materials. This is one example. This is from the interior of a Range Rover Velar. So, you know, very premium material, very premium car, premium interior. But on so many different levels, from a functional, from a sensory, from an emotional level, it's just such a, a feast of experiences. It's a symphony of experiences with different leather with fabrics with the brushed aluminium with the perforated aluminium for the door panel for the cast um, uh, metal for the door handle um, it's such a beautiful series of experiences and now whether you as a consumer 
think about this in a very conscious way or whether you just get in this car and you just feel surrounded by these beautiful surfaces and textures. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's conscious or unconscious, but it helps you appreciate the brand. It changes the way you experience that space purely because of the materials. Um, or if we look at this, and uh, Logitech is one of my uh, favorite examples of a company that's really using materials uh, in an innovative way, because with this, which is um, a UE speaker uh, as part of their uh, UE brand of speakers, you could say, well, actually, is this really a speaker or is this an excuse to have fun? Because by covering the speaker in fabric on the front surface, by putting a soft elastomer material behind it and making it into that shape, it just encourages you to take the speaker, to take music, to enjoy your friend's company with music playing on the beach, in the park, in your bedrooms, out and about. And it's purely because of the way that they're using the material that helps you do this. If it were just a simple black plastic box, you wouldn't have this experience. So um, the first, second chapter in uh, this uh, presentation is my story. I think it's important to explain my story because um, it explains how I think about materials and my approach to the materials and how my studio works. So I come from industrial design background and in uh, 2020, I published the first book on materials, which was the plastic book here, fourth from the left. And <clears throat> I was teaching um, at Central St. Martins in London. I was lecturing on the product design course at the time. And I started these books not because I had a great knowledge of materials or I was had a great uh, desire to write, but actually because I was curious. And the starting point was just a discussion I was having with a friend of mine to say, no one writes about materials. No one writes about product design or design from the perspective of what things are made from and how they're made. <clears throat> and I happened to, at the same time, <clears throat> meet a publisher who was interested in this. And... I think, you know, obviously there are a lot of students listening to this and I would really encourage you, if you have ideas, if you have a desire to do something, then you should reach out and do it. And it doesn't matter if you have no experience with writing, just, you know, do it and worry about how you're going to do it later. Because I met a publisher and she was really interested in my idea, but she said to me, what have you written? And I said, I haven't written anything. She said, well, you have to start, um, show me something you've written. And what I started to do was not necessarily start by creating lots of words, because as I said, I didn't have a great knowledge of materials. The whole process of this journey was about discovery, is that I surrounded my desk with cookbooks. And I looked at the way people talk about food from the way that they use words and they use images and they structure page layouts. And I thought if you can um, talk about materials in the same way that food writers talk about food and you want to eat, then I can write about materials that makes people want to use materials in an interesting way. So that was my starting point, um, the curiosity. And over the last uh, 20 years, since the first book was published, I've now developed this, um, I guess, uh, role as a materials and design expert. This is the book in, in Chinese. Uh, and these are some of the clients that we work with. And with all of these clients, what we're doing is we're working with the design teams and we're working with them on, uh, you could imagine a typical product design process. So it's research, developing concepts, development, and then production. We're not necessarily focusing too much um, on production sometimes, but not all the time. Mostly it's on, on materials, it's around trends. And um, we work within these three industries. So industrial design, materials, and CMF, which stands for color, materials, and finish. So for those of you out there, those students who um, you know, particular, have a particular interest in materials or trends and you don't know what CMF is, you should look it up because it's a big industry. It's an emerging industry. And my books coincided with the growth of CMF as an industry and the growth of interest within materials. And typically, if you come to my office in London, uh, I have an office in Seoul and a satellite studio in Copenhagen. If you come to my office in London, you'll just see the places filled with samples. Um, I try and keep the samples out, not necessarily stored in drawers, in cupboards, because I like to have them on my desk and not necessarily because I'm using them all the time, but I just like to pick them up and play and just unconsciously when I'm having a coffee or talking to people, just let my uh, kind of imagination go with placing one material with another material or bending something, just to 
just to play and in a very informal way. So <clears throat> if you have the opportunity and you can collect some samples, you know, have them out. Don't put them in cupboards. Don't keep them away in drawers because that way you'll never play with them. And then in 2018, I, um, I created a brand. The brand is called Fix It and it's a materials brand and it's a material story. And it's about using uh, a material that is a low, in, low melt temperature. You put the sticks in a cup of hot water, they become soft, you can mold them and then they can become hard and then you can drill or you can cut, you can repair something, you can make things. Um, and then if you don't like it, you can put it back in the hot water and do it again and again and again. And it's a fantastic story. It's a really hard story to tell because, uh, you know, you have to encourage people to repair something in a way that people are not really used to, to doing, but it's a, uh, it's a great project. Um, and like I said at the beginning, the philosophy of the studio is based on this diagram that traditionally, in most cases, you start with a design problem, you then sketch out something, and then you think about the material and that gives you the solution. But what I'm really interested in and what we are talking to our clients always about is to say, what happens if you put the material at the beginning? So you have your issue, then you think about some materials because that will then be much easier to design with rather than trying to find a, a solution that maybe doesn't exist to one of your design problems. Put the materials at the beginning. Or if you really can do this, have materials and then think, what can this material be? Where can this material take me on a journey? And let that um, solve the problem of the issue. Um, and this is really the whole philosophy of the company. And there are three three rules that we have to apply because when we're working with clients clients want to see something new um, and they want to see new materials and it's very difficult to think about new materials because there are very few really new materials out there there are there are some but most of these materials are maybe five years away from production or three years away from production it's quite a long time so we have to define what we mean by new and how you create innovation through uh these three different rules so the first rule is to say you can take a material and use it in a new way which means i'm going to use a different process different manufacturing process to create something new and i'll give you an example of that later or you can take existing materials and use them in a new place which means to recontextualize take a material from sports and put it into a car or materials from medical and put it into electronics materials from interiors and put them into you know another context and then the third one is if you have something new so take a new material using it in a new way in a new place but this is quite challenging because as i said there are not so many new materials in the 1950s we had a huge amount of new materials but not so many these days but this will be an example of a new material this is from carnegie mellon research there and it's about uh self-healing materials and you can see from this uh, these short little clips what it does it's about um, materials that you can cut and then when you move them together they will fuse so this is an example of something new but the problem with this is that no one actually can think about where it could be used and what it what it could do and this might be a great starting point for a project because maybe there is an issue out there that this can solve better that you start with this technology than design something and then think, oh, I need a material that you know, self heals because you're never gonna find it unless you knew this ex existed. And I'm gonna show you some examples of how we work because as I said from the beginning, it's important that you understand that there is this role out there, which is a materials designer. There is an industry called CMF because not many students know that there is this industry, but what we're trying to do is we're trying to identify materials, processes, and then create stories based on these. So this is an example of a material being used in a new way. This is a process called catamold. It's a way to injection mold um, stainless steel, which is traditionally a very hard material to make in complex shapes. So what's the value of this? Well, if you wanna understand um, how to work with it how to manufacture with it we have to give our clients a set of uh information so what its key properties are how do you finish and color it how do you fabricate with it who the supplier is you know is it now is it tomorrow technology is it really in the future 
And then how do you treat it as a surface? So <clears throat> what textures can you put on it? What kind of effects, what patterns that maybe you know, are relevant for this particular application? And then we can start to apply that to a concept and start to build that story within the context of, uh, in this case, a mobile phone. So that was my story. Chapter three is how do you want your materials to be used? So I said right at the beginning, you can't separate materials from the way you process, right? Because it's, it's inseparable. The material doesn't exist unless you can process it somehow. Um, this is one of the bowls that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation. And, you know, people ask me sometimes, what's my favorite material? It, it's a really difficult question to answer because as I said, the material doesn't exist. It has no purpose unless you have an application for it. And this is one of my favorite, um, and there are others in this presentation. This is one of my favorite examples of a material being used. Um, I'm gonna show you the video clip. Uh, and then if you haven't seen the product before, try and work out in your heads what you think the material is. In case you don't know what the material is or you didn't pick up on me telling you what it was earlier on in the presentation, it's actually plain paper. It's the same kind of paper that you would find in a photocopier machine or a printer. But by printing one color on one surface, another color on the other, and by cutting it into very fine um, uh, linear structure, um, it becomes something completely different it becomes a different type of character. It becomes animated. It has tension, it has flexibility, it has compression. It has bounce when you, when you drop it. It has the ability to be twisted. All of these things that you would never describe uh, as a piece of paper. And by that process, by thinking about a different way to apply it, you've opened up a completely different opportunity just by the process. Um, another process which is much more industrial is uh, a, a process that was taken from um, the composites industry. And if you ever get the chance, uh, you should try and visit trade fairs in the future when they start to open, because trade fairs will teach you so much about materials. And if you spend one day just walking up and down the halls and the aisles of these trade fairs, um, you will learn so much. And there is one in particular which... Um, uh, I think it's uh, Shenzhen, but I don't know which year. They alternate called China Plus. If you ever get the chance to go to China Plus and you're interested in plastics, you must go and have a look. It's very, very uh, important because there's so much information. This was taken from a trade fair in Paris. Um, and it's a way to align composite fibers, so carbon fibers, in a way through in a way that you use uh, stitching. Um, and the fibers are arranged in different densities, so more fibers when you need more strength. And um, it's used on aircraft. So I found it in the case study that I found it on was aircraft windows. So there are particular stress points around the windows. So here they put more fibers where there's most strength, uh, where it needs most strength, and less fibers where, where it needs less. Um, and there's an example of the transfer of that by a designer called Alexander Taylor on a project for Adidas, where you can see he's using the same process to create fibers and different densities of fibers within a running shoe. So a very different way to create strength 
or comfort where you need it most and actually keep it quite open where you need it less. Another example is a designer called Oscar Zita who has taken stainless steel. So I said stainless steel, you know, it's quite a hard material as I showed you the example of injection molding with stainless steel. But this is an example where he's taken a flat sheet of stainless steel. He's welded the seams together, puts a valve and then treats it like a tire or a balloon and inflates the, the, the structure. Now, because of the way that he's combining this different type of process with the material, you have a, a very different quality, very different aesthetic of stainless steel, something that looks like a balloon, something that looks like a soft toy. Um, and that combination of the steel with the process gives you, again, something new. And if you don't know these guys, I would look them up on, the, on their website. This, this is MIT Self-Assembly Lab. Um, and they do some amazing things in the way that materials are processed. Because what they say is that materials and have inherent qualities in there, which allows them to be self-forming. So they create their own structure with minimal interference from an external uh, source. Uh, and I was really lucky I went to visit them a few years ago and they showed me this little test piece, which was, I think one of the first things they'd made. And I'll play the little clip because it's incredibly smart in the way that it deals with self-assembly. So what he's doing, it starts out, I'll play it again. He starts out as a, as a, a sphere made up of different components by shaking it and then disassembling those spheres and then shaking it again. The spheres will self form in back into their, their shape. So this was the starting point. And they've done some incredible experiments with uh, fabrics. And maybe you've seen this one before. This is a self forming uh, fabric. And I'll play the video and I'll explain what's happening as we go through the video. So by combining an elasticated fabric, so a stretchy fabric with a 3D printing process, they're able to take the properties of, um, of the fabric in its stretch state. So they take a piece of fabric, they stretch it over a frame, and they 3D print these lines onto the fabric. And you'll see what happens is that the lines become a resistor. They resist the, the, the material wanting to to relax back into its pre-stretched shape. And when they do finally release it and they cut it from the frame, it will self-form into this beautiful structure as you can see now. So all that's happened is these lines have restricted the material stretch and allowed it to grow into this beautiful, what you'll see in a second is a shoe-like shape. So just by taking the properties of the material, i.e. its stretchiness, and by restricting it through a very simple process of putting these lines on the, uh, made from a, a soft rubbery material, you can create a fantastic experiment. So this in a sense is asking the material, you know, what do you want to be stretched piece of fabric? How can I process you in a different way? And what's also great about this is that you don't need a machine. You can get a stretched piece of fabric uh, and then use a hot glue gun just to make some experiments and to test, to see these beautiful structures that can come out. And they've got an example here of a shoe, but maybe it's some cushioning for a, a seat. Maybe it's something that gives you some lightweight, um, you know, air pockets without having to put foam underneath. And then this, which is really clever, is a way of processing um, materials through 3D printing to increase speed, size, and the speed of 3D printing and the scale at which you can do things. And you can see what they're doing here. This is not a material innovation. This is a processing innovation again, like the previous two. By taking this uh, material and injecting it into this uh, you know, viscous jelly-like material, which holds the structure, you can then create a very different type of um, product in a way that you couldn't necessarily do as quickly or on a bigger scale as you could with any other uh, additive process.
So let's move on. The last one in this uh, chapter is, uh, again, one of my favorite examples of a material being used. And it was a project by a designer called Sarat Babu. And this was his graduation project uh, from the RCA in London. And it's about processing. It's about saying, what happens if I take one material and I take a soft grade of that material, silicon, and I take a harder grade of that material and I combine them together. And what you see here is this amazing effect that is so simple. And it's not about a new material, it's about existing materials and actually one material, but a hard version, which is in the inside, which is the core and a soft version, which is the outside. So you can see what happens. And what he's basically exploring is restricting tension of the flexing. So within that structure, you have something which resembles this and being able to control that on a skin creates this fantastic outcome. So you don't necessarily need amazing materials to make amazing projects. Just ask your material how it wants to be processed and look at different ways that you can process it. Right, next chapter, uh, does your material have a story to tell? So I said at the beginning, you know, stories are important. Um, whether we are conscious of story, whether we are unconscious of a story, it's very apparent in car interiors or in consumer electronics or in appliances or in running shoes. When we buy something, when we read about it online or there's a review or it talks about sustainability, for example, there is a story and the materials are part of these stories. And this is not something that's let's say new because back in around a hundred years ago when aluminium was first commercialized, it was a really premium material. It was so premium that people had a cutlery made from aluminium and it was more expensive than silver. And this is a set of combs uh, made of aluminium from around that time. And you can see if you, you, if you can read the text, it talks about aluminium being the champion material and it talks about the prop properties of the aluminium and why it's good for a comb. So even back in those days when you know, we were developing these new types of materials, in this case, aluminium, stories were a big, big part of that. Um, in the 1950s, which was probably the biggest, uh, saw the biggest number of innovations in terms of uh, advanced ceramics or plastics or metals, um, you had huge numbers of stories. And partic particularly because uh, post-war, in this case, this was um, Corning ware, uh, which used a particular glass ceramic uh, material, so-called glass ceramic material. And <clears throat> it was used originally in the missile nose cone. You can see the scientists there because they needed a material for these nose cones that when a missile took off in the middle of, you know, the Alaskan snow, you know, fields, uh, very cold temperatures, it would rapidly accelerate and rapidly heat up. And you know, they needed to develop a Material that it wouldn't break. So this is the outcome of that research. Something could go from very cold to very hot without breaking. And then after the war, they realized that actually there was a, maybe uh, another application for this in cookware. So the idea was that the housewife could put her food in this container, put it in the freezer, take it out of the freezer, put it straight into a hot oven, and it wouldn't break. So you had this story. This is told in a very simplistic way through the the you know, the housewife and the, the scientist and the idea of uh, science providing these technology breakthroughs which were going to help uh, women in the kitchen. Um, and then another story from the 1950s was Tupperware. So Tupperware is made from identity polyethylene. It's a series of food containers. Again, it was made from a factory that was producing uh, parts for the war using identity polyethylene. And it was developed by a guy called Earl Tupper who came up with this idea that this material, which is really soft and waxy and springy, could be used for food containers because if you put your food in the bowl and then you put the lid on it and you push down on the lid, it creates a semi-vacuum. And that semi-vacuum keeps the food uh, fresh for much longer. This was a really hard story to tell because how do you communicate it? Well, he realized, if you, how do you communicate it in a shop? what he realized is that he needed people to tell this story. So the concept came about of Tupperware parties and Tupperware parties were a phenomenally successful um, idea. 
they ran, they may still be running in the United States. In the UK, they ran until maybe 10 years ago. And the idea was that um, housewives would, would meet, one of the housewives would demonstrate the advantages of Tupperware and HDPE, identity polyethylene, um, and then her friends you know, would buy it. And then they would have Tupperware parties. So you had a, a product, a material story that brought uh, people together. I mean, it really was a story that created communities. Um, on a sensory level, and the experience of you know, using tactile and sound and uh, all those other things that are to do with color and, um, and what it looks like, um, they were able to, to take the sound that uh, the lid makes when you let air in and turn that into a marketing story. Because when you open the lid, because there's a vacuum, there is a suck of air. It's quite a small sound, but they realized it had a sound and they gave it the Tupperware burp. So it's a fantastic story that they had to bring out and they had to tell in a very different way. So if you've got products that you have to communicate um, in a different way, you have to think about different ways to tell that story. For me, Fix It is a very similar story. It's a very, very difficult story to tell. I have to find, be very clever about how I get this value across. But if we look to contemporary uh, life and to trends, you know, trends become more and more important. Trends create markets. They create segments for products. They create hierarchies of, you know, uh, good, better, best. And one trend in particular is this trend for artisan, which is, a, I think, a global trend. Um, an artisan, what does it mean? It means that something has been uh, produced and it doesn't matter if it's biscuits, if it's bread, if it's, uh, you know, cookies, um, if it's uh, furniture, uh, it doesn't matter what it means, what, 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 what product area it is. It's about saying something has been made for you with care, with uh, local sort of craftsmen, hopefully. Um, and you see it in everything from chocolate to coffee. And the, the concept of a barista, which didn't exist 15 years ago, is now, is now a job. It's now a career, right? It, it has you know, competitions for baristas to make good coffee because it's all about the artisan. It's all about the experience. And how you develop this and turn this into something that fits with materials and trends is something that we all have, that we have to do. How, for example, if you want to communicate the interior of a car, has the quality of, of artisan and craftsmanship because it, it also connects with sustainability uh, in the sense that you know we're not dealing with cheap, horrible, poisonous materials that we're actually dealing with crafted materials. You have to translate that into something that's mass produced and that has a value for customers. BMW i3 is an example of that. This is a story that you can't see. I mean, you cannot see the stories that are in these materials. You cannot see that number four, for example, which is um, a particular type of wood that has um, eucalyptus wood, which doesn't, which doesn't require varnishes. It has a natural uh, ability to withstand uh, with, 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 uh, uh, scratches and chemicals. Or for example, um, the uh, leather in the car seats, number one, which uses a different way to process leather and not using poisonous tannins. Or number two, which is using recycled PET for the, the dashboard. These are things you, that brands have to build out. They have to tell those stories. These are invisible, but, and this is another example of invisible material. This is um, a shoe made from uh, leather, 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 whatever we can define leather as now, uh, because we have pineapple leather, we have apple leather, and this is, which is an example of grape leather using the waste from the food industry, which is a huge industry. I mean, you know, waste from food is like, and turning that into a material, it's huge. Like I said, apple, pineapple, uh, in this case, grape, all kind of food or orange skin into plastic material, huge industry. Um, and again, again, another shoe, which is slightly different story, but this is premium because premium is becoming entwined with sustainability. Uh, because these, um, I guess, influencers like Stella McCartney, uh, who believes passionately about sustainability, and she says that her design starts with sustainability, um, have to think about new ways. And the loop shoe is a way to disassemble the shoe. It doesn't use glue. So glue is, is bad. It's really bad because if you can't take something apart, then you can't recycle the components. Um, to 
uh, if you so her concept with this is that it's mechanically joined, uh, and when you when you finish with it, you know, all the parts can can be separated and recycled very easily. Um, and if you want to understand about sustainability and materials, you should have a look at her website. She has a very nice section that talks about which materials that she uses, why she uses them, et cetera, et cetera. But if we really want to understand stories and how as designers we can build these stories, we have to, we, and this is how my work in my studio, that we, we break that story down into an experience because as I've said, all of these case studies are about building experiences. It's the reason why I choose to buy one brand of car over another, why I choose to buy Adidas over Nike, because I buy into that experience. And that, if you break it down to materials, comes from functional, emotional, and sensorial. And that means simply the way that something performs, the way that something makes you feel, or the way that something is in the way that it looks or smells or when it touches. So for example, sensoriality, this is a sofa by the Campana brothers. You just want to throw yourself into this. You want to rub your hands all over your face everywhere because it feels fluffy. It feels really uh, cozy and, uh, and cute, right? It's a sensory experience. I just want to sit in there. I want to lie in there. I want to roll around in there, okay? It's just to do with the way that it feels. Emotional is a little bit harder to explain because emotional is how a material can make you feel. Going into a car which has leather, for example, and beautiful surfaces like the one I showed you at the beginning, makes you feel like it's a premium experience rather than just a car, which is just plastic. The example of this is why it's emotional is because one of the, I think, most innovative things about Dyson is using transparent polycarbonate to show the dust, which is a big, big, a bold step to do because you would say, well, who actually wants to see dirt? But by seeing the dirt, you feel more rewarded. You feel like, oh, my house is cleaner because the dirt is in the container or the original iMac with the translucent colored shell that allows you to see the technology and demystify technology and actually make it look great on your desk and make you feel like, oh, this is something I wanna have. I really enjoy having this computer as part of my home. It's not something that sits under a desk hidden away. And functionality is about performance, right? So here, this is um, a material called the Infinity, and it's used uh, in Adidas. It's part of their brand DNA, this lumpy white material. And there's a very interesting story about this because it was used, it was developed originally for milking cows. Cows produce much better milk if they're on soft ground and dairy farming, you know, it's on concrete, right? I mean, cows on, on field, it's one thing, but if you wanna get lots of milk like cows, you put them in a factory, um, in a dairy. And, you know, concrete's not so good, doesn't make them produce such milk. So they wanted a soft material that, that would feel comfortable for the cows, but also would be really durable because, you know, cows are gonna break things, right, with their hooves, um, and they could clean very easily. They could get chemicals, they could get water and hose it down. And this was a material developed for that, but, Somebody at Adidas had this amazing insight and, and vision that it could be used for running shoes because one of the other properties it had was really good bounce, right? So if it has good bounce, it can make you go faster. It's more comfortable. So this is really about functionality, right? It's about wearing these shoes makes you run faster. But if we think about this, which is the same shoe, but this time it's using um, fibers from reclaimed plastic ocean waste, we add another component to our story. So functionality means that it is lightweight and it has good bounds, makes you run faster. Sensoriality, because it's 3D printed uh, fabric, means that it's probably more comfortable, makes you feel more comfortable. Emotionally, because it's made from plastic waste, ocean waste, it makes you feel less guilty, makes you feel better about the environment. So these three properties, you can tune, you can play with. What is it you want to heighten? What is it you want to create more of a, um, a story about? So it's about, it becomes now about emotional experience if we put the, the 3D printed ocean waste. It's not about functional anymore. The most important one is the emotional. It makes us feel better. So the last chapter is uh, how good is your material for the environment? Um, you have to be very careful because sustainability is a huge complex, complex uh, issue and problem. Uh, that we are in my studio trying to, to understand and get to grips with. It's easy to say that plastic is a terrible thing because of everything that you see, because you see plastic ocean waste, you see plastic bags caught in trees, you see plastic litter on streets, you see plastic in birds. 
but if you were to look at the, the impact of plastic in a bag versus cotton in a bag, there was some research that was done in Denmark that said you had to use a cotton bag 7,100 times uh, for it to be as environmentally friendly as a shopping bag. So you'd have to use a bag, a cotton bag, every day for 10 years for it to be the same as a plastic bag. And so it's no longer a case, of, and, and cotton also, as we have to remember, is one of the worst pollutants on the planet because of chemicals, because of water usage, pesticides, all that sort of stuff. So it's not a simple equation, um, but it's becoming more premium. Going back to the BMW i, it's a premium story, right? And that's partly to do with justifying costs. But if we really want to draw people in, and if we really want our materials to, to communicate these stories, then it's slightly difficult if you can't see it because, you know, I kind of want to, I want to symbolize, you know, and, uh, and, uh, my kind of passion for saving the environment. This is a brand called House of Mali who use uh, cork rubber for the base and then speckled material, which is using recycled content, I think, uh, with reclaimed fabric for the speaker. Uh, and all their products have these stories and it's a very distinctive look. I mean, it's very, very distinctive. It looks kind of like bits have been taken from different places and put them together. But it becomes very visual, right? As does this. This is um, Google's phone case, uh, pixel case. What's interesting about this and more and more examples of this is that it looks different because of these specs. These specs reflect the fact that it has waste in it. The fact that it's taking PET bottles from, uh, from the ocean and putting that in the fabric so that it um, it isn't just a case of like the BMW i, which is invisible. It becomes very visible. It becomes um, uh, almost like the aspiration, like, oh, I, I love the effect and I love the story. Uh, and we can look at this, which is a Speedo swimming goggle. And if you look at the headband, um, the black speckles that you can see are waste from the manufacturing process that have been chopped up because the, they use black silicon for the nose bridge and for the eye seal. Um, it's been chopped up and then mixed with the red virgin uh, silicon to reduce the amount of virgin silicon, but also to give it this decoration, right? I mean, you can see that w when was the last time anybody had given any de de um, you know, design detailing to the headband? Usually it's just one strip of plastic, uh, silicon. But by including the waste, it creates a story, right? It becomes an emotional story. So I'm going to leave you with uh, a last thought, which is, I started the talk with a question, what is it your material wants to be? But very often your material will make it up its own story as it goes through life. Because you know my interpretation of something that was inherited to me or I inherited from my parents or my grandparents is gonna be a very different story to somebody else's version of that same product. So materials will change their story. They will create a different set of experiences. And one of the things that I, um, questions that I ask when I'm doing workshops, just to kind of start things off and warm things up is I ask people to tell me what their strongest material memory from childhood is. And what this question reveals is that, you know, when we talk about materials, we assume that the most important thing about a material is how is it gonna work, right? Is it gonna stand up to the function? But when I ask this question, no one ever says, oh, my favorite memory of a material was of um, an amazingly comfortable sofa. It's never, oh, I had this toy and it was made out of this plastic and I could never break it. It's never about the performance. It's always about, I found a piece of fabric that was my mother's scarf and it became my toy. It was, I, I found a piece of chalk that I could draw on a wall, or I found a piece of wood that I could cut up and turn into an airplane. It's always about the experience, always about the emotional value that materials have brought to, to the people that I asked this question. So I'm gonna leave you with one final point. Yes, ask your materials what they want to be. But the most important thing to consider is the materials will make up their own story and people will create their own experiences. And materials are really important at creating these experiences. So as designers, do what you can to create these great experiences um, using those kind of set of rules that I highlighted. But also bear in mind that it is uh, up to the user who will create their own version of these stories. Thank you very much.